Good morning, and welcome to the July 5th, 2017 Board of County Commissioners meeting. I'm Kate Flavin, Public Information Officer for Sedgwick County. Commissioners, I trust that you had a safe and enjoyable holiday um, we had yesterday, and I would like to bring up Alora Forshee, the Director of Emergency Communications, to talk about the numbers that came into the call center. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Laura Forshee, I'm your Director of 911. As you guys remember, every year we have been standing at the non-emergency number for 911 for those fireworks and nuisance complaints. And just like every other year, when I look at the numbers the next day, I'm so thankful that we do that so that we can move those calls off of those 911 lines uh, to help alleviate that call volume. <coughs> Excuse me. To remind you, we had four operational periods for that non-emergency line. It started on July 1st and went through July 4th, every day starting at 6.30 p.m. and going to 3 a.m. the next morning. So just to give you some numbers to let you know what we did with those lines, uh, during the first operational period, again beginning July 1st, we took 137 fireworks or nuisance calls. On July 2nd, that second operational period, there were 121. And then it really ramped up on July 3rd with 174 calls. And then last night, as you heard, I'm sure in your neighborhoods with a lot of fireworks going off, we had 394 fireworks or nuisance calls that came in on those lines. And those aren't the only calls that increase over the 4th of July holiday. A, a lot of calls do increase as people are getting together and gathering and having a good time and accidents happen and the such. Um, this year, starting on July 1st through current, we took 800, or excuse me, we took about 2,200 calls um, daily, about 9,000 during that period. So to let you know what that looks like comparative to what we normally do, we normally take about 1,500 calls a day. So we definitely experience a higher call volume during the 4th of July holiday. Uh, the non-emergency line took more calls this year than it did last year. Part of that may be due to inclement weather we had during the 4th of July period last year. But either way, we're seeing the public uh, really start to embrace that line to utilize it to help us to keep those 911 calls uh, coming in on those emergency lines and we're thankful for that support from our community in doing so. I'm proud of my staff. They did a great job this weekend with that call volume and um, I just think you have a great team over there to be proud of. Any questions? Well, Laura, thank you for that report and uh, let your staff know that we are also proud of them. Um, well. I know this was um, an extra special effort to make sure that our citizens had an opportunity to call in the the folks who call in the regular 911 uh, system mm -hmm. i know you dispatch police or ems but those that call in on the non-emergency line do you just give them advice or give them another phone number to call or? the great thing with that is that those lines are answered by 911 team members as well and so it's treated the same way as if it went in on a 911 line it's just a line that can maybe go at a slower pace um, if calls start to stack up there where if somebody's not holding that has a heart attack for example and so those are still dispatched out to police and fire and they still check the area for those fireworks complaints and so it's handled the same way so the citizen really sees the same outcome either way and that's where the great benefit is for them in using it okay well thank you for that information I mm -hmm. think others had a same question I preempted them but uh, right. thanks for the information and um, and once again, just tell your staff that we appreciate their um, good response to what looked like, what, a 30% increase in call volume at least. Absolutely. So, I will. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And commissioners, one more reminder. The Sedgwick County Fair begins today and runs through this weekend. So be sure to come out and check out the Sedgwick County booth on Saturday. And with that, I will let you kick off the meeting, Chairman. All right, Kate, thank you for that. Uh, appreciate that um, introduction to our meeting. I want to welcome everyone who's here in our meeting today and welcome those who are watching by way of television. And with that, uh, I will call to order the regular meeting of the Board of County Commissioners, July 5th, 2017. Madam Clerk, first item. Invocation to be led by Pastor Caleb Bowman, Calvary Baptist Church. Please remain standing for the flag salute. Please bow with me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I come before you on behalf of this board and on behalf of our, our community. I thank you for the wonderful grace displayed through your abundant resources in our community and also the peaceful lifestyle that we are able to enjoy. Lord, help us to be wise stewards of all that you have given. Please help us to be generous to others as you have been to us. I pray for this meeting. I pray that it will be efficient and productive, and may your will be done through these, your servants. Bless them and their families, I pray, for their service. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag 
of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And Pastor Bowman, thank you for being here today. And I might uh, comment that uh, you're one of the staff pastors at uh, Calvary Baptist Church where uh, Commissioner Hal worships. So appreciate you being here today. All right. Thank you. Madam Clerk, next item. Roll call. Commissioner Dennis. Present. Commissioner Ransaw. Present. Commissioner Howell. Present. Commissioner O'Donnell. Present. Chairman Unruh. Present. And next item. Public agenda. Uh, commissioners, we do have a couple of folks who would like to speak on a public agenda, and um, one person has signed up to speak on an agenda item, um, so we'll see if they want to speak um, in order here, whether they want to wait until that agenda item is called. But we'll start off with um, Mr. Kent Hickson, who wants to make a comment on storm drainage issues. Good morning. Uh, I am Kent, Hick Kent Hickson, the city administrator in Mulvane, and thank you for allowing me to address the commission today. Uh, the issue at hand uh, for me and, and some others that are here is storm water management, storm drainage. Um, as you may recall, on August 19th of 2016, Southeast Sedgwick County experienced a major rainfall flood event. This storm had the characteristics of a flash flood with reported rainfall amounts ranging from 6 to 10 inches in less than two hours. Flooding along Styx Creek, which runs through Mulvane, resulted in structural damage to approximately 70 residential homes and nine commercial structures in the Mulvane area. The value of the loss was well over a million dollars. Th three structures were so badly damaged as to require condemnation and removal. The Styx Creek drainage basin begins two miles north of the city of Mulvane in Sedgwick County. Flooding does not occur only inside city limits, but in a large area of the unincorporated county. As we approach the one-year anniversary of that flood event, I'm here to, to, remind, to first remind the Commission that stormwater problems affect every area of Sedgwick County, not just the incorporated uh, areas inside cities. And then second, suggest that the solutions to these stormwater management issues can best be accomplished by a partnership with the county and the cities in the county. The key to stormwater management projects that prevent property damage or loss is taking a comprehensive, big picture approach to the task. I'm asking the county to take the lead in the study, planning, and project implementation of stormwater management that will provide a safe and secure living environment for the citizens. I'm here to advocate that the county develop some sort of a dependable revenue stream dedicated to the study, planning, and construction of stormwater management projects in the county. I can appreciate that no one likes taxes or fee increases. However, I can assure you there are dozens of property owners in the Mulvane area that if you ask them today, would you support a sales tax or some other fee that would prevent your property from being damaged by flood, the annual cost being about equal to a happy meal a year, they'd say yes. I appreciate the work the county has done through the Stormwater Management Board, but we need to strengthen the county and the city's partnership and increase our efforts to make a significant impact on a problem that affects all property owners in the county. Thank you for your time. Do you have any questions of me? Uh, thank you, Mr. Hickson. Yes, we do have a comment from Commissioner Howell. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to say I appreciate uh, Manager Hickson for being here today and for speaking on this topic. Um, I have spent um, probably out of all the topics I've, I've worked on the la in the last year or two, this has been one topic that has uh, taken probably the majority of my my time. Um, how it relates to uh, flood, you know, flooding issues uh, as well as uh, the road uh, issues that are especially in Rockford Township, um, this has certainly been a, a pretty major topic that has uh, continued to be something I've worked on uh, for quite a long time. I have said the same thing, and Mr. Hickson, I want I want you to know that. Uh, I have written articles on this in the Derby Informer. I don't know if you saw those or not, but I do think that uh, we agree that a dependable revenue stream is really the key. And I'd like to put this, put this in perspective. Um, just uh, what we know right now, and I may not have exactly the right number, so I apologize if I don't have the right numbers. But let me just ballpark this, I guess. Uh, just the, uh, the, the Spring Creek Watershed Study has about 260 projects listed in that uh, study and uh, about $262 million worth of projects. And again, those may not be exactly the right numbers. I apologize if I don't have those, but 
off the top of off, off the top of my head, I think those are close enough to make my point. I think we know about uh, we know about other projects that need to be done of about another quarter billion dollars, and so you add that up, it's about a half billion dollars worth of projects we're aware of that need to be taken care of. That, as you said, do impact uh, all of Sedgwick County. Um, it's not just in in any one district, and I would say sometimes these mitigations might need to be done outside of our county because they impact what goes on inside the county. Uh, flooding happens as a consequence of really a couple of things. Uh, number one, we have enormous amounts of water that uh, we know that will happen again. It's just a matter of time. We always have uh, record rainfalls, it seems like every every few years that happens. If you look at the, the history of this, uh, over the last 20 years or so, we've had uh, times where uh, you know it's almost like you can't plan you almost can't plan uh, how to manage this much water. Just last year we had uh, two 100 two 100 year floods and a 500 year flood last year. Am I correct? Is that something you like agree that, with yes. that? And I've been watching the rainfall totals and uh, the ground was saturated and and uh, the reality is uh, we're just unprepared for that type of rainfall. Uh, we know this is going to happen again someday in, in the future, so it's it's really upon us right now to start planning ahead on how we're going to manage this. But when you look at about a, when you look at that many projects and that much money, it's hard to uh, to know where to begin. And that's why I've it, the stormwater um, they call it the SMAB, the, the Sedgwick County uh, Stormwater Management Advisory Board, has been meeting uh, as of as, I think they've had three meetings this year or in the last in the last year. A uh, number of years uh, they did not meet because they, they felt that, that uh, the county commission wasn't going to fund any of the suggestions that came out of the advisory board. Well, I think we've changed that culture a little bit. I think they know that we're uh, re-engaged in this discussion. And, and, and as I said in my, one of my recent articles, the challenge is how to keep this how to keep this uh, um, how to keep this topic alive. Uh, I made I made the point that a few years ago when we were going through a drought season. Uh, there was a, some discussion about raising the sales tax to uh, to bolster our water supply. Um, that failed, I think, for a number of reasons. But uh, the point of the matter is, is we've had a lot of rain since then, and the discussion about a water supply has kind of gone by the wayside. We don't talk about that so much. And I think the reason we're talking about stormwater today is because we've had a lot of rain. And so the key is uh, two things. We've got to keep this uh, topic alive when we're not in a uh, flood time. We've got to keep this uh, topic alive. We've got to find a way to fund it over time. Um, the second thing is we need to find a revenue stream because with existing revenues, you know, most of our money is is earmarked for certain things. We we provide about 40 different services uh, to a, a half million half a million residents of Sedgwick County, and um, there's not huge amounts of money that we can funnel into to providing solutions to this. And so, we, if we were successful, I would say. Even a couple hundred thousand dollars a year would be would be a significant um, investment in this problem. But uh, I will be dead a long time before we get through those projects if that if we only do it at that rate. And so I guess the, the key really is going to be uh, how do we find a revenue stream that's dedicated uh, to that idea? And there's a number of ways of doing that. You mentioned this, the cost of a Happy Meal was that per month or per year? Per year. Per year. It's very very. You know, we're talking about really. five dollars a year type of uh, type of uh, issue. And I don't know how much money that that would generate. We did we did just raise our our solid waste fees by a dollar. I'm sure you're aware of that. And uh, the reason that uh, that we did that, I believe, I'm not sure about all my colleagues, but at least for me personally, it's my goal that we would we would funnel some of that money over to doing some uh, ice storm damage. Again, I made the point in my recent article. We've had four uh, large ice storms in the last 20 years, and most of the the trees that are fallen as a result of that ice buildup, uh, that those trees are still laying in those uh, streams and waterways and have not been picked up and so that that is debris that's clogging up our waterways and causing problems I mentioned a minute ago the things that cause flooding is again having a large amount of water but it's also that uh, we clog the water going away from our communities and we don't manage the water coming into the communities effectively enough and so it's a combination of all of that that causes flooding and that's why these projects are kind of addressing all of that and I would like to just also point out that uh, in our next year's budget we are adding uh, two uh, two more crew to our two more people to our stream maintenance crew, which I think is a, a great move. Uh, that's back to uh, uh, something we said we kind of used to have six on that crew. We we went down to four, I think, to, for some uh, for some budget pressures. We're taking that back to six this year. We're also buying them equipment that is necessary for them to, for them to do their job, and that's great. We can use some of the solid waste fees uh, potentially, and um, I am also supportive of a two hundred thousand dollar study. To help us get things uh, understood in other places in the county and get and get the pro get that priority list uh, back to the county commission, so we know what to fund. But again, without a revenue stream, a dependable revenue stream over time, we're not going to 
I, I'm afraid that the the uh, subject will eventually, um, when we get back to a drought season, that uh, the momentum may slow down. I hope that doesn't happen. Um, a dedicated revenue stream is the way to go, and, and and there's ways of doing that, whether it be through a a yearly fee on the property taxes or a, or a, some type of a small sales tax. Um, there are ways we can do this, and again, I'm generally against taxes, uh, but I, I am also for good government, and we need to take care of our infrastructure. And when people want things like highways uh, and good roads, uh, they don't mind paying taxes for those types of things. And this is one of those things right now where it is. Uh, the iron is hot. It's time to strike potentially, I think, to to have this discussion of a, of a dependable revenue stream that would uh, fund this thing over time. Uh, so when the drought when the drought comes, we'll still be uh, engaged in stormwater management uh, mitigations and solutions. And so I have I have worked on this a lot. Um, uh, the Rockford Township, especially, has been a tremendous topic in my district. I spend probably an hour or two every single day. Uh, dealing with uh, Rockford Township roads, uh, whether it be writing emails or, talk, or talking to people on the phone. It is a huge topic, and people are not happy uh, with their roads out that way. And it's all related to stormwater. That's what's going on. Um, and there's other issues in, in the, on those roads as well. But uh, the point is it's a major issue in District 5. And uh, so I want to say thank you for being here today. Um, we need to keep, uh, keep the topic moving forward. This is a good time to have this discussion. Uh, if we were going to use certain types of revenue, it does require legislation to give us that opportunity. Uh, I would also support uh, voter approval. Ideally, I think uh, people do get it. Uh, they, they do support uh, taxes for things they understand, uh, things that make sense, that, that are good government. I think they, they generally do support those ideas. So if it's a sales tax, I think that's where we need to head. If it's going to be some other type of fee, uh, we, need to, we need to explore how to do that and how much and that type of thing. But. Um, certainly, uh, uh, the revenue stream is the key to solving this problem because with existing revenues, half a billion dollar problem is not going to get fixed in my lifetime. And so uh, uh, we're going to have to find a way to solve that problem. I'm sorry, I've talked a little bit time here, but this is a big topic for me. And you've scratched an scratched issue that I'm very passionate about. And I wanted to just take the time to, exp to number one, explain where we're at as a county, as well as uh, commend you and thank you for your comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. I uh, don't see anyone else. Wishing to speak, so thanks for your comments. Very morning. good. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, we have a second person that would like to speak, uh, Ms. Kathy Sexton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Kathy Sexton, Derby City Manager. Appreciate the opportunity to come before you all today, and, and we did bring a few folks who have been concerned and, have, and did attend a county meeting that was held last month in Derby, and um, it was great because uh, we were glad to finally, honestly, finally see one implementation step from the 2014 study that the county commissioned at the Spring Creek Basin, which shockingly, I think we were all surprised, um, let us know how bad the creek erosion is in the uh, 32 square miles of the Spring Creek drainage basin, only one third of which is the city of Derby. So space-wise, this basin, Spring Creek, is from bordered on the west by McConnell Air Force Base, on the east by 143rd Street, on the north by Pawnee. So a little bit of Wichita is in this basin and, and more all the time as Wichita grows into its southeast quadrant. But certainly, Derby's at the bottom of the basin. We're at the, in the south end of the basin, and these creeks all come together and flow through Derby till they get to the Ark River. And what happens by some, what, what our, our uh, folks who live along those creeks find out, or people who didn't even think they lived along a creek, but they live close enough, that when the rain's coming down hard and fast and those creeks have the severe erosion that they have, it is constantly um, backyards are falling into creeks. Um, uh, trees are falling into creeks, fences are falling in, somebody's back of their garage is falling in. These things happen in our city, but really um, those are the results. They're not the causes. The causes are mostly in the county, in the 20-some square miles of this basin that are not in the city. And it's really difficult. Um, I got to introduce a few folks today who were good enough to spend their time today coming with me downtown. And if y'all could, could wave a little bit when I say your name, I'd appreciate it. Julie Sontag is here, and she lives on this Spring Creek in in Derby and has been grew up there and has lived there a long time and and is seeing um, her own basement flooding and her yard flooding and and is seeing uh, it happening more frequently with smaller rains. So this is not about one big flooding event that hit Mulvane in August. This is about 
pretty much uh, this area was affected three times last year, a 500-year flood and a one, two 100-year floods. And what Julie is seeing is just there's just more and more effect, and that is easy to think maybe that's development in Derby. Maybe that's the target parking lot or the, you know, the car dealership that's being built or whatever. But what this study proved, and we're very appreciative um, for Dave Spears and his leadership and Susan Erlewine's leadership, Jim Weber, to have gotten this study done a few years ago to help us all realize that Derby's, we can always improve, but Derby's development regulations are requirements on new development, people who build new homes and new businesses do account for stormwater drainage and require that the developers leave the the lot in um, as good or better condition than the way they found it. In other words, if they're building a parking lot, they're making also a detention pond or they're making drainage structures. Maybe you can't see because maybe they're underground, but they are required and we do heavily enforce those. And we've been very pleased with the um, support of the storm of the county stormwater manager uh, stormwater engineer and stormwater management folks and and before and after these storms this past year <laughs> dave's meager little staff of four people were helping clean out creeks before those creeks dumped into derby and after the creeks uh, you know between derby and the river as they were clearly log jammed and um, full of junk i mean when everybody's backyards flood you get chairs and <laughs> grills and all kinds of things in these creeks and it's hard to keep the water flowing so derby has staff that do that too and um and we have our own storm water fee on everybody's water bill and a few years ago when that was passed by the derby city council of course folks didn't like that nobody likes to pay three bucks more every month on a that kind of a fee but you know what um, we we have a because we have a dedicated funding stream we're able to do a project every year and we're able to have staff who respond to the calls and and clear the creeks and explain to people how to get flood insurance if they live in a FEMA floodplain and things like that also joining me this morning are Pat and Nancy Farley if you guys want to wave a little bit um, these folks also have lived in Derby for over 40 years and I've seen um, extreme flooding uh, in recent years and what uh, what Pat mentioned to me a while back was you know we used to get a four inch rain and we kind of knew how that would look in our backyard and the creek levels and but now you get the same kind of out of the bank experience when it's a two inch rain so we are not just talking about major flooding events that are uh, what you call 100 year floods and what have you but you're talking about just heavy rain events and a lot of times it surprises you because it's not the rain that's coming down in Derby that matters it's the rain that's coming down north of Derby out in the county so it all flows together Bill Smith is with us as well Bill thank you for coming um, you've seen and, and in the 1995 big storms that we had when we had FEMA uh, buyouts I don't know Dave I was at the county here you were too I don't know too many other folks around this table were but but the the fed the federal government bought out several homes in Derby and, and Bills was one of those and so he understands how this works and he was on our Derby planning commission for many years so understands this is long-term planning and this is joint uh, cooperation and partnership and that's what we're asking for today is y'all's understanding that this is not a Derby problem that Derby's ignoring and coming to you asking you to, to solve this is a countywide problem and a lot of the issues are occurring in the county that then they just dump into Derby because we just happen to be at the south end of the basin right so we want to partner with you all and to make that point even uh, bigger it's um, uh, I think helpful to know that Tim Johnson is here from the city of Goddard he's their community development director he's also a recent addition to the county stormwater management advisory board he understands and is learning more about the history of our SMAB committee and what we've recommended in terms of funding and um, and also I think just the broader understanding that this is an issue that affects all communities just depends on where the rain falls you know so it, it is a countywide issue and we appreciate your um, support certainly your recent vote for uh, funding more of the creek uh, stream maintenance uh, efforts is very helpful and really honestly um, Jim your comments are on target I mean this that's a lot of money involved in any of this but I think what's frustrating and after some of these folks went to the county's meeting last month in Derby the emails I got and follow-up and the frustration after the meeting was really um, you know we can't just talk about how big the problem is and then ignore it right. you know we've we you have had this data for four years 
and finally had the first meeting last month to talk about some of the individual things that are in here that could be done. And I know it's difficult because we have a road and bridge department. We have a page in the budget book for Comcare and EMS and 911. What we need is a department, a focus, a management effort that understands stormwater is a real thing. It's a real infrastructure thing that this county cannot ignore anymore. I mean, we, we it'll just keep getting worse. And this is about economic development. It is about private property as well as public property being devalued. Um, and, and when people, I'm literally, I literally mean there was someone at this meeting who was talking about uh, his trees and his farm ground and falling into the creek as the creek continues to widen and erode. And But there are things in this document that those engineers that, that you all hired at that time said could be done. And really what we want to encourage you all to do is pick away at that, you know, chip away at that big elephant. I mean, you have to be able to say, what are we doing this year for stormwater? We, what are we doing next year? And certainly the, the funding source is a big piece, but um, anything you all can do to help would be appreciated, and, and I certainly appreciate your time and would be happy to take any questions you all might have of me. Okay, Kathy, thank you for being here. Um, I, I have a, a question. What is the date of that report you're referring to? It's dated January 2014. The bulk of the work was done in 2013, and yeah. it is on your website. And in your... And in your um, uh, study of that is it still pretty relevant in it? you know that's a fabulous question it's relevant because it's a basin study um, done with standards that you use for watershed basins it tries to assess well here's the big picture and here's some ideas and then what you have to do is you go you have to go didn't develop and zero in on each idea so for example we um, we were building a park at the old st mary's school in derby on madison so it's called madison avenue central park it's all open now but if you've ever been there before you know it's what what through that park used to be a ditch well now we dug that out we got fema permits and everything and now it holds way more water than it used to hold so when these storms are these heavy rains are coming down we literally have people who go to the park and watch the big hole fill up because it is exciting to know that those houses downstream of that big hole are no longer being flooded. They can get to their homes and the streets aren't flooded. So we took that effort and said, let's implement that. And we're looking at other pieces and parts. The county's meeting that was last month was the part that said, county, you should call in the property owners of folks who own 20 acres or more up in the county in the upper reaches of this basin. So we'll call that agricultural or pasture land. The problems are often happening because of their um, cattle manure, their horse manure, and their conservation or lack thereof practices. And so, so there were things that let's get the federal government folks who do soil conservation together with the property owners out in the count, county. And a few of those made connections under Susan Erlenwein's leadership that evening. And, and so that was one step. So yes, I do think there's a lot of relevance, but what you can't do is you can't think this is a done deal. I mean, you have to dig into one item in the book and then either put a staff person on it or hire a consultant. Derby's putting in our budget for next year a specific study to say, okay, given all these many recommendations, what's something Derby could do besides the five projects we have on our list right now already funded by our stormwater fee. Does that make sense? Yes. There's uh, a lake in there, for example. One idea is an 80-acre lake that would be north of Derby in this basin area, which the county, I mean, you could look into that. You could say, well, what would that take? Is there land available? Is there a willing seller? What kind of money would that take? I know for years, park enthusiasts have talked about a a county lake somewhere other than way out at Lake Afton, you know, sort of a eastern or southeastern corner of the county. I don't know if that's still in discussion or not, but but there would be other uses for said lake besides just stormwater. Does that answer the yes, question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Appreciate it. We do have a comment from Commissioner Howell. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to, since you are on the Sedgwick County Stormwater Management Advisory Board, or SMAB, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, I believe I heard the other day there was like, there's 28 watersheds in Sedgwick County. Is that the number that you remember oh, hearing before? I don't know. I don't know how many there are. There's a bunch. I don't know if that's correct or not, yeah. but that's, that's the number that I remember hearing, I think. And we, I think we've only studied, I think, two or three of those. Two. Two of those. And so, again, so, oh, there's a lot we don't know. Yeah. And uh, I know that Commissioner Commissioner Dennis, uh, his district especially, I think, has a lot of uh, a lot of challenges because he represents roughly half of Sedgwick County, especially the rural part of Sedgwick County, where a lot of these problems are, are, uh, are there. And so... We don't really, <clears throat> right now we don't seem to we actually have a, a plan on how to, how to address this over time. And that's really, I think, the frustration that we're all having is we don't really have a, <clears throat> excuse me, we don't actually have a great plan on how to execute. 
Commissioner, if I could just comment, I think that's a fabulous point. If the county commissioners in 1950 and the Wichita City Council members and the Valley Center City Council members in 1950 had seen, oh, this is such a big problem, let's not do anything, well, then we wouldn't have a big ditch. And we wouldn't have, or whatever you want to really call that. Dave hates it when I call that. Stormwater, I don't know, floodway, Wichita Valley Center, floodway, Mitch something, floodway. something, something. It's the big ditch for a reason. It had too long of a name, right? So, so, but I mean, that helped downtown Wichita become the thriving economic center and core of this community that it is today because without that it would not be that. It was an economic development issue and those commissioners, those elected officials at that time thought big thoughts and, and whatever it took, I don't know, but that's exactly what's needed now. We need to think bigger on this or we, we're just, um, we're not leaving our land better than we found it for our grandchildren if we don't deal with this issue. Let me, let me continue my question. You know, I want to say, number one, Madison Avenue Central Park is fantastic. You did a tremendous job, uh, and the city did a tremendous job. The city council members did a, a fabulous job designing that park. It's one of the best, I think, in, in our county. Um, but it is a retention pond, and it's uh, fascinating that uh, that's designed to, <coughs> excuse me, to manage the amount, the extra water when it flows in. It actually does protect uh, people downstream. And I think that, uh, we, I think you and I have talked before, and I don't know if you can please, please comment on this, but as we develop uh, areas uh, north of the, north of Derby, um, we are doing our very best, I think, to regulate how we manage water on those development areas. Any any neighborhood developments that go in, there are retention ponds uh, there that uh, that meter water out at a at a prescribed rate that can be handled from those folks downstream. And so, as we develop property north of the city, it does slow the water down. It does manage the water flow. So it's not rushing into the city. And one of the things I said a minute ago is we get too much rain all at once, but we also don't, uh, we have the clogs going on downstream, but we also have not enough management, up, management upstream. And so the management upstream is the key, is part of the key. And I know Madison Avenue Central, Madison Avenue Central Park, much like High Park, are designed to, to manage that to extra water when that happens. And so, I, you know, we've talked before uh, about, uh, you know, what are the problems with, with Derby and Mulvane and uh, what are the areas? And so we, we I think you and I have talked about this a number of times. I think we talked about this at the meeting in Derby. Uh, we've, we've put a, as a concentration, uh, our stream maintenance folks have spent a lot of time uh, down on Spring Creek, especially south of, south of Derby, trying to manage uh, the clogs, if you will, trying to make the water can flow away from Derby as kind of a first step. Um, and as, as development continues to happen on the north side of the city, we're managing that through, through regulations and requiring retention ponds and, and uh, um, I'm not sure what the right terms are, but it only allows water to, to flow certain rates uh, towards Derby. So one of the things I think is misunderstood by a lot of folks is because we are growing as a, as a community, that the reason a two inch rain acts like a four inch rain is because the assumption is we're not managing the water flow into the city. And I'd like to hear your comment on, on that aspect of this, if you don't mind. Well, I think that's what the engineers who put together the study found, is, and that, that was the surprising aha for us, because when you see buildings get built, you assume that's your problem. And what the engineers told us is, no, that's not your problem. There are always more regulations you could put forward, but you have pretty good regulations. And this commission and the Wichita City Council and Derby and others have, have re made requirements for stormwater drainage, and that's why you see ponds and, and more uh, uh, structures mostly underground, but that get built when we build new new infrastructure. So I think the important thing is to, you know, if you want to talk about just this basin, the issue is the creeks, there is no development around them. We're talking 20 square miles of rural, residential, rural farming, horse pens, cattle pens, that kind of thing that they talk specifically in here about agricultural lagoon that needs has issues, some septic systems that have issues out in this area. Um, just creeks that are eroded, creeks that need uh, rock ripples and, and riffles and, and other uh, bank stabilization efforts. So this isn't about, well, somebody wants to build something, so let's make them do extra because they're a developer. Uh, no, this is about um, talking with current property owners and trying to um, get new ways of doing things and new um, efforts to stabilize creeks and banks and 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 why i mean i want to say i appreciate the county's efforts to come help clear out the clogs but i mean after the flooding happens <laughs> because the list was so long dave spears's list is so long and he had four staff for the whole county so if that stuff had been cleared out before the big rains came last year 
there'd be a lot of folks in Derby who'd be a lot better off. You know what I'm saying? I mean, this is a matter of you have to get out ahead of it. You can't, you can't wait for it to happen. And then, I mean, we're playing catch up. But we appreciate everything you're I, doing to help us play catch up. Yeah, we do really do. Playing, I do agree. I think we're playing catch up. And this has been going on for a long time. Again, that list didn't just happen last year. That list has been growing for a long time. Um, and with respect to a, a two inch rain acting like a four inch rain, I have been following the, the rainfall um, in the in Sedgwick County since the beginning of 2016 uh, very closely. And I, I think you'll see that uh, 2016 was, a, was almost a record in terms of our rainfall. It was uh, absolutely incredible. The interesting thing is 2017 is actually um, more rainfall now this year than we had last year. So it's actually trending upward. We're actually seeing more rainfall right now than we did la last year. So we're actually hitting a, essentially a new record here in 2017. So it's not really letting up and the problem continues to, to, to plague us. And um, I guess I want to say one more thing and that is, uh, you know, Sedgwick County stream maintenance, we are actually clearing the streams, taking the, deb the debris out of the streams, removing that so it doesn't clog up something downstream. And our method, of course, is, is regulated by the state of Kansas. Uh, we've got to do 90-degree uh, uh, degree entrances from people's private property to the streams. We've got to coordinate with landowners, make sure we have permission. We use heavy equipment, and they, they do a great job clearing those streams. And, um, and we leave it much better shape than we did when we, uh, when we found it. Um, that is happening, but it takes, it's a slow process. And, uh, some of the, I don't, I, if you're willing to speak on this too, I don't know, I've never asked you this question before, but I understand inside the city of Derby, you're not actually removing the debris, you're, you're cutting it down and it's, it's intended to float away, so to speak. And so I'm not sure how much of this actually being removed from the streams within Derby versus what we're doing outside the county. We're actually removing that debris, taking it out of the stream entirely, and we're reseeding that and, and resloping banks and things like that. Um, so I think our method is a little bit different than what happens inside the city of Derby. I'm not quite sure why that is, but I'd like to know more about because that. Because when you build houses in a city and you put them right beside each other, you can no longer get heavy equipment behind them when they build up against a creek. It's about access. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you all very, very much. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Appreciate uh, the discussion. We have one more person that has signed up to speak on the uh, public agenda. Cindy Proitt wants to speak on we have an agenda item with that topic. Would you like to speak now or would you rather? Uh, I will wait. You will wait. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, that being the case, we have concluded the public, public agenda and um, I'll ask the clerk to call the next item. Proclamations. Item A. Proclamation declaring Sedgwick <coughs> County Law Camp Days. <coughs> Commissioners, I have a um, proclamation for your consideration. Whereas approximately 150 youth between the ages of 10 and 14 will attend the 22nd annual Sedgwick County Law Camp July 10th to 14th, 2017 at Lake Afton Park. And whereas the mission of the Leaders Achievers Winners Camp, known as the Law Camp, is to create a partnership between law enforcement and youth by providing a positive experience using law enforcement and National Guard personnel as role models to build self-esteem, confidence, and trust, and whereas the youth will be assigned to mentors who will keep track of the activity schedule. The mentors will operate in teams of two consisting of one deputy and one soldier from the Kansas Army National Guard, and whereas Law Camp is a partnership involving more than 32 public and private organizations. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, David M. Unruh, Chairman of the Board of Sedgwick County Commissioners, do hereby proclaim July 10th to 14th, 2017 as Sedgwick County Law Camp Days in recognition of this effort to involve our youth in alternatives to crime and violence. Commissioners, you've heard the proclamation. What's the will of the board? Move to approve the, adopt the proclamation. Second. Thank you. Madam Clerk, call the vote. Commissioner Dennis. Aye. Commissioner Ransaw. Aye. Commissioner Howell. Aye. Commissioner O'Donnell. Aye. Chairman Enru. Aye. And we have, um, I don't know your rank. Lieutenant Denny with the Sheriff's Lieutenant, Officer. Lieutenant, sorry, pardon me for that uh, lapse of memory, but thank you for being here and, and um, uh, thank you for receiving the proclamation. It's my pleasure, sir. I, I don't think I could add any more about this camp than what is in this proclamation, and uh, we appreciate your support in this proclamation. 
Well, thank you, and uh, we want you to um, express our appreciation to all the uh, members of the Sheriff's Department who's involved in the and the National Guard. I believe this is um, one of the really outstanding efforts in our community to help involve youth and to let them uh, learn some discipline and learn about what uh, law enforcement is, and so we're, we're very pleased to be supportive. I will pass that on, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. Next item, please. Appointments. Item B, resolution reappointing Karen Countryman Rosworm, Dan Soliday, and Julie Rinke to the Sedgwick County Juvenile Corrections Advisory Board. Mr. Chairman, Eric Yost, County Councilor, we have a number of appointments here this morning. Item B is a resolution reappointing uh, the three individuals just named uh, as at-large members of the uh, Juvenile Corrections Advisory Board. There are six at-large members and we're reappointing uh, these three at this time. Uh, their new terms uh, would expire June 30 of 2020. Uh, I, I don't believe any of them are present to be sworn in, uh, but I would urge adoption of this resolution. All right, thank you. Commissioners, what's the will of the board? I will move that we adopt the resolution. Second. We have a second. Any discussion? Madam Clerk, call the vote. Commissioner Dennis? Aye. Commissioner Ransaw? Aye. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Chairman Unruh. Aye. And I think the council is correct. No one is here of this list. All right. Uh, Madam Clerk, next item. Item C. Accept the resignation of Lee Castor, Jr. from the Keechai Township Board Treasurer position. Mr. Chairman, Eric Yost, County Councilor again. Items C and D pertain to the Keechai Township Board Treasurer position. Uh, item C is the resolution accepting the resignation of Lee Castor, Jr. Uh, as Treasurer. Uh, Mr. Castro had served more than 10 years and felt that it was time to retire. Uh, Keechai Township is in Commissioner Unruh's district, uh, and Commissioner Unruh is recommending that Mr. Gerald Seibel be appointed to that position. Uh, state law, of course, requires that the commission, the county commission, fill these township vacancies. Uh, Mr. Seibel's um, term would expire January 11 of 2021. Uh, I understand he is going to be president to be sworn. And I would urge adoption of both resolutions, uh, our items C and D. All right, thank you. Um, I will move that we adopt the resolutions for both items C and D. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, call the vote. Commissioner Dennis? Aye. Commissioner Ransaw? Aye. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Chairman Enru? Aye. And Mr. Seibel, is, is he here? <coughs> Is he present? Okay. Then we will move on, and he will get sworn in at another appropriate time. Um, next item, please. Item E, accept the resignation of Art Gentry from the Metropolitan Area Planning Commission. Mr. Chairman, uh, item, items E and F pertain to uh, Metropolitan Area Planning Commission membership. Uh, Mr. Art Gentry has uh, resigned uh, from that board. Uh, and item E is his resignation and a resolution approving that. Uh, he had been an appointee of Commissioner O'Donnell. Uh, item F is a resolution appointing Joshua Blick uh, to fill Mr. Gentry's position on the MAPC. Uh, Mr. Blick is recommended by Commissioner O'Donnell for that uh, position. Mr. Blick would serve the unexpired term of Mr. Gentry, uh, which would end on August 31 of this year, uh, and Mr. Blick is president or I'm told he's going to be president uh, and I would urge adoption of both of these resolutions uh, Mr. Chair I move that we accept these resignations and the appointment um, but Mr. Blick is not here okay we have a, a motion is second there, please we have a second yeah second we have a second thank you um, Madam Clerk call the vote Commissioner Dennis aye Commissioner Ransall aye Commissioner Howell aye Commissioner O'Donnell aye Chairman Henry aye all right, then we will move on to the next item. New business, item G, <coughs> PUD 2017-1, a county zone change from SF20 single family residential district to PUD planned unit development on property generally located on the south side of MacArthur Road, 600 feet west of South Meridian Avenue. Dale Miller, planning staff. 
as she indicated, this is a request to rezone property to planned unit development. Uh, the applicant, uh, this would be a th the third in a series of industrial parks that they have developed. Uh, one of them is located uh, immediately to the east here. Then the other one is, is about a mile and a half, or to the west, I'm sorry, uh, to the, and then to the east, about a mile and a half to the east on Seneca. They have another one going in, but this would be uh, proposed to be developed for, to support industrial and commercial uses in the south part of the, the county. Uh, Planning Commission recommended approval. Uh, as you can see, there are uh, there's some limited commercial here where the red is, the SF-20 is the pink. Uh, that's the, uh, the planned unit development that uh, the app, one of the applicants' uh, companies currently is operating. And then there's a residential uh, use to the south. It's currently vacant. Uh, there are uh, homes to the east over here to the southeast. Um, there is a home here and he, uh, here, uh, farm ground to the north, a uh, series of smaller lots fronting uh, south side of MacArthur, farm ground. Comprehensive plan suggests this is appropriate for uh, new residential uses. However, uh, the commission has the ability, uh, given a case-by-case -case basis, to uh, modify and, and approve those uses that they deem appropriate. Here's the PUD that they've submitted. Uh, the applicants have agreed to screen along this eastern segment and the southern segment and then to also add uh, a screening wall here to protect these folks here. This uh, the agreement to do the screening wall came after the Planning Commission recommendation for approval, and so it will take a two-thirds majority vote to approve uh, what the applicant has agreed to with the neighbors. Uh, there was 11 percent protest, which uh, does not trigger the supermajority vote, but because you would be overriding uh, the Planning Commission's recommendation uh, to add that wall and to make make it clear the wall was not offered at Planning Commission so they didn't have an opportunity to review that and that was done after the fact and uh, but the applicant is is in agreement with that and the agent is here and can speak specifically uh, to questions if you have any and with that I try and answer questions all right thank you Dale Commissioner do you have any questions on this application I don't see any. Um, we this this is not a public hearing, but on zone changes, we typically offer citizens an opportunity to make a statement if they would like, whether it's the applicant or one of the protesters. If there's anybody who wants to make a statement, now would be a time. I don't see anyone rising to speak. So, commissioners, I will ask you, what's the will of the board? Mr. Chairman, I move that uh, we adopt the zone change subject to the conditions rep recommended by the Metropolitan Area Planning Commission, adopt the findings of the MAPC, and authorize the chairman to sign. And that's with the uh, amendments that was uh, identified uh, today. So it will require a two-third majority. Thank you. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to um, accept the zone change with the modification. Um, is there any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Commissioner Dennis? Aye. Commissioner Ransell? Aye. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Chairman Enrue? <coughs> Aye. Next item, please. <coughs> item H, ZON 2017-18 and CUP 2017-16, zone change from SF20 single family residential to LC limited commercial and the creation of the R.D. Wood Commercial Community Unit Plan. DP-343. Dale Miller again, planning staff. Uh, <clears throat> the application area is here. Uh, the applicant is proposing to develop a self-service storage warehouse facility and have ancillary neighborhood retail commercial uses 
as, as the opportunity may arise. Uh, the, the seller of this land also owns the land to the north and the east. Uh, as you can see here, there's a subdivision zone single family to the west across 135th Street. There are, is some LC zoned land, limited commercial, that has been developed with uh, residential uses. And then there's a SF5 zoned subdivision here. Uh, initially, uh, these folks were concerned with the development of this site. As you can see here, barely, there's a creek that comes in from this direction and another one that comes in and joins just at the south edge of the application area. And their concern was that if this is developed, how would that impact the stormwater as it, as it hits this subdivision and then goes through that drainage channel. As you can see, it's vacant to, today. You can see the subdivision here to the south, the uh, retention pond or large lot residential area here, the homes across the street. Uh, the comprehensive plan says that this property is appropriate for residential employment mixed uses, so it's consistent with the adopted plan. Here is the community unit plan that's being proposed, and you can see they have a reserve here. Uh, one of the things that uh, the applicant agreed to do was to extend this reserve all the way across, and uh, these two reserves are basically open space and uh, drainage. You can see how the self-storage units would be developed here and then two parcels for uh, neighborhood retail. Uh, planning Commission recommended approval and then after Planning Commission and at the, uh, the County Advisory Board, the applicant and the, and the neighbors got together and the applicant agreed to four or five additional conditions that the Planning Commission uh, was not offered, so we'll need another two-thirds vote uh, to approve as the recommended by the county advisory board. Uh, basically it was increasing the landscaping, uh, increasing the facades that would have uh, masonry or some form of, of treatment that would be different than just metal. And uh, one of the things was to extend that reserve and the applicant has agreed to that. The plan that you have received uh, reflects those amended conditions. And as a result of that, there was no protest provided uh, for this. So uh, other than the fact that you need to override the Planning Commission since they didn't have an opportunity to review the conditions agreed to at the CAB, uh, need a two-thirds vote. The agent is here and try and answer questions. All right, thank you. Uh, comment from Commissioner Dennis. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, first of all, I, I appreciate uh, uh, all of the support from the citizens in, in uh, District 3 and also from the applicant. Uh, uh, I thought that it was a very productive uh, meeting that we had at the Citizens Advisory Board. Uh, I believe that they came up with an agreement that both the community and the applicant uh, agrees with and, and that will serve the, the area very well. Uh, so. Uh, it uh, was the first major case that our Citizens Advisory Board had, and I thought it had a great outcome. So, therefore, I do uh, move that uh, we adopt findings of the Metropolitan Area Planning Commission, approve the zone change and CUP subject to the conditions recommended by the MAPC as suggested to be modified by the Citizens Advisory Board and approve the resolution and authorize the resolution to be published. And I understand it does take a two-thirds majority. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Is there a second? Second. second. We have a second. Um, is there any comment from commissioners or any further questions? Before we call the vote, once again, we'll ask if there's any citizens who um, would like to speak to this. Uh, and once again, it's not a public hearing, but we'll give you the opportunity to speak, either the applicant or any citizens. I see no one rising to speak, so um, commissioners, any other comment? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, call the vote. Commissioner Dennis. Aye. Commissioner Ransall. Aye. Commissioner Howell. Aye. Commissioner O'Donnell. Aye. Chairman Unruh. Aye. And next item, please. Item I, amendment to the listing requirements for electronic signs in the Unified Building and Trade Code.
Chairman Unruh, Commissioners, uh, Chris Labrum, Director of the Metropolitan Area Building and Construction Department. Good morning and thank you. Uh, as stated, I'll be uh, briefing the resolution to amend Section uh, 4.2.240 of the uh, UBTC, specifically addressing uh, electrical sign code. Uh, summary of what we do in the MABC uh, with codes, we obviously enforce uh, numerous codes, uh, different, uh, roughly a dozen different types. Uh, we do receive, or those codes are pushed to us through International Code Council and other national organizations, as was the case in this code. It was pushed in 2014. We've been working since to adopt. Uh, codes are revised and updated at, on a three-year cycle in order to uh, stay current and work with industry. Reasons we update the codes, of course, uh, mainly based on public safety and adopting and utilizing best practices throughout communities. This also ensures consistency across jurisdictions and allows uh, trade professionals uh, consistency in their training and uh, certifications. Includes two parts, uh, the adoption of the uh, new and updated code, obviously the extensive review that's associated with that. Also uh, the creation and adoption of any local amendments uh, in the case here. Uh, uh, to this point, I would like to uh, commend our local sign companies as part of this. Approximately 40 companies came together to uh, reach a uh, solution to this amendment, uh, which was a, a great cooperative effort, and uh, we are greatly appreciate, appreciative of their work and cooperation in that. Specifically, sir, uh, the amendment allows for sign companies to submit documentation of listed products. Listed products or a listed sign would include those tested by an underwriting uh, laboratory and uh, certifying the signs as such. This code would, would have required all local sign companies to use a listed sign at a potentially great expense to those companies. Uh, obviously, if a sign is already listed with a laboratory, uh, they're compliant with the code. In the case that uh, the sign is, is unique, then sign companies can submit or will submit documentation of that sign and a list of the products being used. We will review uh, that plan and those products, assuming that they all meet the criteria that would be listed. Well, we then uh, can approve that sign and allow them to press forward with installation. The, uh, there is a, a second part to this in which uh, we are requiring that a electrical contractor do the electrical hookup of that sign to the facility. That can either be a sign company uh, receiving an electrical, pro, uh, electrical contractor's license and having their master electrician do that work or uh, having that contracted. Are there any questions, Chairman um, or Commissioners? <clears throat> commissioners, do you have any questions for Chris? Any other comment? Um, I think we do have a citizen who would like to speak to this, so before we go any further, um, Chris, we'll ask you to step aside and... Um, you don't have to go far. <laughs> Ms. Proitt, if you'd just uh, tell us your name. Yeah, I'm Cindy Proitt. I'm with Luminous Neon Sign Company, and I really just wanted to commend um, Chris Nordic and, and the MABCD on involving the sign companies and giving us input and helping to come to the best resolution to hopefully make this as painless as possible. This probably isn't um, a resolution that the sign industry would have would have initiated or sought otherwise, but we think we've come to the best resolution possible. Um, I would really just like to commend them. This went on for, for many, many months um, trying to come to a solution, and so with that, we'd like to encourage you to implement. Well, thank you very much. It's, thank you. Uh, it's good to hear when people are together <laughs> and all on the same page and saying, let's go forward. So thank you for taking the time to come. You um, are from Hutchinson? Is I'm based out of Hutchinson, yes. Okay, all right. Well, thank you for taking the, making the effort to be here. Uh, we have a question from Commissioner Hal. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to say I, I uh, want to officially welcome Chris Labram. I, I, I don't know if he, this is his first meeting he's actually spoken at, if I understand that correctly. And uh, he's done a, doing a great job. I'm glad to have you on our Sedgwick County team. and. Uh, as, as a matter of uh, business, uh, I'm really impressed at how you and your, uh, your you and your folks have led on this issue to find a good compromise that everyone seems to be supportive of. Uh, this is uh, one of those areas where I think that it, 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 on the outset it seemed like it was going to be very much a lot of conflict and maybe a lot of upset f folks and businesses maybe weren't, weren't going to be real happy with the regulations being put out, but uh, but you found a way to get it done. And I just want to say thank you for 
for working on this and, and making a great compromise that uh, I guess uh, addresses our, our concerns as well as uh, allows these businesses to, to continue to do what they do and be competitive and, and uh, be successful. So uh, I want to say thank you for all you've done in leading on this issue and, and your folks that work with you as well. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion we would approve the resolution. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there further comment? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, call the vote. Commissioner Dennis. Aye. Commissioner Ransaw. Aye. Commissioner Howell. Aye. Commissioner O'Donnell. Aye. Chairman Unruh. Aye. Thank you, Chris. Next item. Item J, a resolution waiving application of the Sedgwick <coughs> County Service Drive Code as it pertains to certain property located in Sedgwick County, Kansas. Good morning, Commissioners. Dan Wagner, Sedgwick County Fire District Number 1. Uh, what we have here is a request for a variance to the service drive code. This property is uh, north of US 254 and east of 143rd. It actually uh, contains four properties, uh, the one directly off 143rd, and then this property back here, and then there's two other landlocked 20-acre uh, parcels. Um, all parties are in agreement with the request for variance of the service code. Um, there's a little bit of history with this property um, from the access off of 254 being shut down by KDOT um, in 1995 um, and then around 19 or 2006 um, the house there at 143rd was built 2004 um, the grant from subdivision was allowed to put four properties on a service drive and instead of doing the rural roadways. Um, so all parties are requesting that the Board of Commissions uh, grant them a waiver of the service drive code. I'll stand for any questions that you've got. Well, thank you. Um, we, we appreciate your hard work on this. It's, it's kind of been a long, arduous uh, process to get to this point because it requires some um, uh, documents that relieve Sedgwick County from any liability as far as accessing those properties. So. Um, that took some extra work, but I believe we've got to the point where the landowners are happy, and so um, I, I'm hopeful that we will go ahead with this uh, application. But uh, commissioners, or any other comment or questions? If there are none, then it, I will make a motion uh, that we approve the resolution. Second. And we have a second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Before we call for the vote to make clear this, um, the waivers by landowners have to be signed and, um, and registered with the deed before this takes effect, is that correct? Yes, sir. All, all landowners have uh, signed the waiver. Um, it will be given to the clerk's office um, as soon as the Board of County Commissioners uh, signs off on, on the resolution. Um, that will be attached with the register of the deeds for each one of these properties showing that there is a waiver of liability to Sedgwick County and the emergency services for these properties. All right, thank you. Well, with that explanation, I see no more uh, requests to speak, so I will ask the clerk to call the vote. Commissioner Dennis. Aye. Commissioner Ransall. Aye. Commissioner Howell. Aye. Commissioner O'Donnell. Aye. Chairman Unruh. Aye. Thank you, thank Commissioner. You, Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Next item. Item K, Report of the Board of Bids and Contracts Regular Meeting on June 29, 2017. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Joe Thomas, Purchasing Director. Uh, the meeting held on June 29th for the Board of Bids and Contracts. We have four items that are being presented for your approval this morning. Item number one is the 2017 High Dense Seal for Public Works. This recommendation is to accept the bid from Andale Construction Incorporated in the amount of $395,414.70. Item number two is a rental uniform and map program for various county departments. This recommendation is to utilize the U.S. Communities Contract Number 50716 and establish contract pricing through March 31, 2019. Item number three is Hanson Mobile Software Upgrade for the Metropolitan Area Building and Construction Department. This recommendation is to accept the quote from N4 Public Sector for an initial purchase of $76,428, estimated travel expenses of $7,500, 
and establish contract pricing at the rates listed for maintenance and support for years two through years the year five for an estimated total five-year cost of one hundred thirty nine thousand eight hundred thirty four dollars and forty eight cents and our final item item number four is maintenance and support renewal for the electronic patient care reporting system for emergency medical services this recommendation is to accept the quote from health ems for a total five-year renewal cost of three hundred thirty seven thousand five hundred seventy two dollars I'll be happy to answer questions that you may have and recommend approval of these items. Okay, Joe, thank you. Commissioners, are there any questions or comment? Seeing none, what's the will of the board? Mr. Chair, I move that we approve the dead board resolution. All right, thank you. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Commissioner Howell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just looking at this. Uh, Closely uh, on these on these uh, four items, um, the first one, we only received one bid. Is that correct? That is correct. The yes, second sir. one, we only received one bid. If I'm seeing this correctly, Cintas was the only one that uh, bid on that. And that item number number three. I'm sorry. Pardon? Pardon no, me? I was going to. I'm sorry. On the item number two, yes. it wasn't that we had received just one bid. It it was a. Uh, we took advantage of the joint governmental purchase from U.S. Oh. communities. That was done competitively, and okay. we're piggybacking. Well, that helps. That, 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 that's great. And then number, number three, uh, again, is this just a single opportunity? I don't think there's any anybody else that's uh, competing with that. This is a, a contract for, for, for software we already have, I guess. Yes. So that, that kind of eliminates uh, any options, I think, for others to compete on that. And then number four, again, that's, a, that's another one of these things where we only have a choice of one, it looks like. So we're going to go forward or not go forward. So I guess in all four of these, it's interesting to me that uh, unlike a lot of the other uh, Board of Biz and Contracts reports, this one seems like it has just a single option in all four cases, which uh, makes me a little bit uncomfortable. But uh, I appreciate the work that, that you guys do. Just more of a comment. I hope we've, we could try to, you know, in terms of uh, trying to make sure we have competition on these is, is really important. And the one that's most interesting to me out of these four is the first one can you please talk about uh, what exactly are they going to do with the uh, ceiling and paving it's about it's about uh, sixty eight thousand dollars per mile what are they doing for that type of uh, those dollars i think david spear has a comments for you commissioner Hal david spears uh, assistant county manager for public works uh this is a product that we have used in the past uh it it is like a fog seal it's uh uh, the longevity of it is really uh, good. It will last for more than five years. Um, we used it out on uh, Old Highway 54. We've used it down in Clearwater around that area. And uh, we have tried several, several, several products over the years. And um, you know, a, a frictional seal, which that was used like on uh, your project down on 63rd, and it's not uh, reacting as well as this so this is a product that we have found it's used across the country and it, it's one of the better ones for a fog seal that has longevity so uh, Andale is the ones that put this down I think there's different vendors across the country that that do that but uh, apparently they're the only ones that wanted to bid in this area okay well that, that helps a lot now I guess the other comment I would make is this is only 5.75 miles, and we have um, quite a lot of miles of road to maintain at some point. So, at that rate, uh, are we going to are we going to end up trying to follow the same type of technology on on, on a lot of these other roads around the county? Because that seems like a pretty high uh, expensive uh, no, process. No, so we we have a lot of different tools in our toolbox for preventing maintenance, and most of them are very competitive and uh, we've been very successful with it and as you know we were on a five-year program now we're going to a six-year program and uh, 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 like I say we look at the road I individually and see the engineers look at it at what application that we need to make and then we choose accordingly and we always try to get the biggest bang for the buck and I, th I think we do uh, we will keep watching this product and and if if the price would start even getting higher we would consider doing something different so we do we watch it all the time all right well thank you for the explanation and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to support the recommendation uh, the uh, the motion this morning thank you mr. chairman 
Thank you. We do have a motion and a second. Is that correct, Madam Clerk? All right. Is there any further discussion? Please call a vote. Commissioner Dennis? Aye. Commissioner Ransell? Aye. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Chairman Enru? Aye. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Joe. Next item, please. Consent agenda. Commissioners, uh, Mike Scholes, County Manager, recommend you approve consent agenda items Lima through Alpha Delta. What's the will of the board? Move we approve Lima through Alpha Delta. Second. Madam Clerk, call a vote. Commissioner Dennis? Aye. Commissioner Ransall? Aye. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Chairman Enru? Aye. And I see our agenda calls for legislative issues, but I don't think we have anything to discuss there. Uh, and we do need to have a fire district meeting. So commissioners, I believe now is the time to uh, recess the regular meeting of the Board of County Commissioners and call to order the Board of County Commissioners setting as the governing body of fire district number one. And Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Dennis. Present. Commissioner Ransom. Present. Commissioner Howell. Present. Commissioner O'Donnell. Present. Chairman Enru. Present. Next item, please. Public agenda. I have had no one register to speak, so we will call next item. Consideration of minutes. Item A, regular fire meeting minutes of May 17, 2017. Commissioners, uh, is there a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Um, any discussion? Madam Clerk, call the vote. Commissioner Dennis. Aye. Commissioner Ransaw. Aye. Commissioner Howell. Aye. Commissioner O'Donnell. Aye. Chairman Enru. Aye. And next item, please. Consent agenda. Uh, Commissioners Mike Scholes, County Manager, recommend you approve consent agenda item Bravo. What's the will of the board? Mr. Chair, I move that we approve consent agenda item Bravo. Second. Thank you. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Call the vote, please. Commissioner Dennis. Aye. Commissioner Ransaw. Aye. Commissioner Howell. Aye. Commissioner O'Donnell. Aye. Chairman Enru. Aye. Is there anything else to come before the fire district commissioners or Mr. Manager? All right. Seeing none, then we will adjourn the meeting of the Board of County Commissioners setting as a governing body of fire district number one and call back to order the recessed meeting of the regular meeting of the Board of County Commissioners for July 5th. And um, this time, Madam Clerk, are we ready for other? Yes. Commissioners, is there anything else uh, relating to county business that you'd like to bring up right now? Commissioner Hell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to say uh, commissioners have had a, a number, number of opportunities. I've uh, been able to take advantage of a, a few things I'd like to talk about for just a minute. The one that stands out to me um, is uh, I was able to attend a, uh, the uh, Wichita Police Department Homeless Outreach Team presentation uh, a week ago, and I, was, I just wanted to say I'm, I'm extremely impressed with uh, the processes and uh, the processes that uh, the Wichita Police Department is currently using to, uh, to combat and assist and help the, uh, the homeless in our community. There's a gentleman, a uh, police officer, his name is Nate. I'm going to say his last name wrong. Schwiegel. Schwiegel. Thank you for, so much for helping me with that. But he's a tremendous individual. He's leading that uh, effort, and uh, I'm extremely impressed with him. He made a presentation. I know there's a number of videos that uh, Wichita has hosted on their website as well as on their Facebook page, and I encourage the, the public to uh, go watch those, and you will also be impressed. Uh, some of the data around this is uh, the, the homeless population nearly doubled from 2009 to 2011 and has continued to be a, a challenge for our community, but uh, with the homeless outreach team's efforts, they have done a number of things to help. And I just want to say I'm really impressed. I want to say thank you to them for uh, caring and for helping so many folks the way they do. Um, they have helped uh, hundreds and hundreds of people in our community be re reunited with their families to find uh, permanent housing, uh, to uh, deal with uh, uh, substance abuse and mental illness and all kinds of other issues that are that are dealing with that population. So I just want to say thank you to. Uh, Wichita Police Department for what they do on the homeless outreach team. I'm so impressed and I want to say thank you speci specifically to Officer uh, Nate Schwiel, if I'm saying that correctly. And then second of all, I wanted to say uh, Commissioner Dennis uh, did a good job uh, uh, organizing an event where we got to talk to the USS Wichita crew uh, that happened to be here last week. Uh, really enjoyed that. Uh, 
I'm excited to see uh, a Navy ship uh, with the Wichita name on it, and I know that he may he may want to speak on this as well. But I just want to say thank you for uh, his work and helping us to meet that uh, that crew. It's a very exciting for this community to have a ship with the with the Wichita name um, in the in the Navy. It's uh, going to be a very fast, agile. It's a small ship in terms of ship sizes. It's still more than a it's about a football field long. It's still a, a large ship in my opinion, but uh, uh, but in terms of uh, other uh, compared to other ships, this is I think the fastest ship in the in the Navy fleet. And uh, it's exciting to have the Wichita name on that. Um, there's a number of other things we're doing around town, but I won't talk about any more. I just wanted to say, well, I guess I'll say one more thing. Uh, Commissioner Dennis and I also attended the uh, law enforcement recruit graduation last, last Friday, 21 recruits um, for Wichita and uh, for Sedgwick County Sheriff's Office. It was exciting to see these folks. Uh, they do a, a tremendous job. I'm looking forward to seeing these folks get trained in our new law enforcement training center. Uh, that would be open here later this year. I'm, I'm reminded that that's extremely necessary, but it's great to see 21 new recru recruits uh, graduate from our training our training uh, program jointly with Wichita, and uh, that was also very very good. Um, with that, that's all my comments for now. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Hal. Uh, Commissioner Dennis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, first, I want to join uh, Commissioner Hal in congratulating our new sheriff deputies, and also Commissioner Ranzel was there with us also at the. At the commissioning ceremony, uh, I want to remind everyone. Kate made a, a nice comment about it, but we do have the fair coming up. Uh, we have a parade tonight at 6:30, and the fair is starting. So I want to recommend uh, everyone head out to Cheney, out to the big third district, and join us out there. Okay, thank you. Uh, no, I got two more comments. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought you were. Yeah, I thought you hit your high point. But go ahead. He had a pregnant pause there. All right. <laughs> Uh, also, I want to join Commissioner Helen and all of our commissioners that uh, made uh, the visit of the crew from the USS Wichita uh, successful here last week. Uh, they were very, very busy. Uh, I'm sure that they were very tired by the time that they ended the trip, uh, uh, but it was a, a great way to recognize uh, some of our men and women that uh, are serving our country and that will serve on uh, the USS Wichita. The final comment that I've got is that uh, a uh, number of you probably saw that we had an en banc meeting last week. I don't know if the chairman was going to mention that, but uh, uh, we do have a working group meeting coming up on Friday, and hopefully we can have that resolved. Uh, we're very close. Uh, hopefully we can have a resolution so that we can vote on that uh, next week. That's all I have. Thank you. Well, thank you, Commissioner. And uh, I, I appreciate you mentioning the en banc where we talked about um, our EMS service to the community. And I think in light of the fact that it's very clear that citizens of Sedgwick County want us to, um, as much as possible, have uh, unified, uh, consolidated services. And probably our EMS service is the uh, crowning example of how two governments can work together to provide excellent service for their communities. And uh, we understand that. I'm sure the city of Wichita understands that. And we will uh, continue to have a process that is um, efficient um, and and actually is uh, compared to other communities um, an economical service that does a great job. So as we uh, continue to go forward in those discussions, I look for a positive outcome. I see no one else asking to speak, uh, so I believe we do have an executive session. Yes, we do, Mr. Chair. I move that the Board of County Commissioners recess into executive session for 45 minutes to uh, consider consultation with an attorney for this commission, which would be deemed privileged in the attorney-client relationship, and preliminary discussions relating to acquisitions of real property, and that the Board of County Commissioners return to this room from executive session no sooner than 11.05, and this executive session is required to protect attorney-client <coughs> privilege and public interest, protect the county's financial interests and right to confidentiality of its negotiating position, Mr. Chair. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, Mr. Counselor, do you? I just you... want to recommend that we meet in the manager's conference room for that. There are several topics. Okay, okay. We, we will do that. Um, Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Commissioner Dennis. Aye. Commissioner Ransaw. Aye. Commissioner Howell. Aye. Commissioner O'Donnell. Aye. Chairman Enru. Aye. So we are That's presently true. in recess to executive session.
Between the thin red line, the thin blue line, and the thin white line lies the thin gold line. This narrowest of lines represents those who are rarely seen, but always heard and appreciated. The calm voice in the dark, the heroes behind the scenes, the golden glue that holds it all together. 911 dispatchers. Cedric County 911, what is your emergency? The 911 dispatcher is essential. When I'm en route to a call, they're continuously giving us updates, so I know what's going on before I get to the call. And then when I arrive at the call, sometimes I'm the only person, so they're my eyes and ears when I can't be. <laughs> One thing that drew me in the most is I love helping people. And then I started and realized that I love how much we help people and um, the excitement every day is different. Nine one dispatchers are extremely important to Cedric County Fire Department. They're the first ones on scene. They're the ones that have the first contact with our citizens that are having this emergency. They are the ones who notify what units need to go for, to a particular emergency. They're the ones who tell us how many units need to go. They are a vital success to the outcome of all the calls that we run. We couldn't do that job without them. I really wanted to be that person after you go through something really traumatic and you have to call 911 and then you finally get that calm voice and you're like, okay, it's going to be okay. Hectic, but very rewarding because you never know what's going to happen on that next phone call, whether you're going to be saving a life. My favorite part about the job is the adrenaline. Um, I love the fast pace when things are getting busy, um, when we're getting chases or when we're, you know, really helping someone that I know needs the help. If you're interested in being the first first responder, email work for 911 at sedgwick.gov or call 660-4977 for more information. Wichita was built on a floodplain. Early settlers even called the area from hillside to ridge road swampland. In the 1800s, several large floods hit the area. But it wasn't until after the 1944 flood that left more than 5,000 temporarily homeless, the city started a flood control committee. That's where M.S. Mitch Mitchell, or Big Ditch Mitch, comes into the story. After just 10 days on the job as an office engineer, he was sent out into the field. They made me wade through about a foot and a half of water. Now, I'm in my office dress and shoes, and they made me wade through the water to, to get to the road where the, where the uh, drive was. And what started out as a six-week commitment to the project led to a lifelong career with the city-county flood control office. A lot of planning went into how many of those local flooding systems can be incorporated in that particular project, and the floodway was the only way to do it. But convincing everyone it was a good idea was another story. There was a tremendous amount of objection to the acquisition of right-of-way for that. We don't have any flooding up here and you're ruining my field and you're cutting off the highway and all of those things that they did not recognize the importance of that diversion. The design for the Wichita Valley Center floodway was modeled after one Mitchell saw in California. They were very helpful. They sent us their manuals for construction of the lining, for the maintenance of the lining, how these things should be under drain system, so they gave us the design work for what you see on the paved canal now. The main project was the diversion of the Little Arkansas River, some water from the Chisholm Creek system, and some water from the Arkansas River through what became known as the Big Ditch. There were people who said, you can't do that. You can't put that Little River water in the Big River. Well, we did. And that big ditch has been his legacy. Tony Giuliano is the art director for Sedgwick County. You've probably seen his work. But when he's not designing for the county, he's got his whistle on the soccer pitch. 
he looked at me and he said, you're skinny, you're young, you can run, you should ref soccer. And 15 years later, I'm still doing it. Moving up the ranks. And it's opened up a lot of doors for me. I ref at the local level and the JUCO and the uh, NAI levels all the way up to, to Division One. Achieving a collegiate level national badge. It's exhilarating. Uh, I, I, I really enjoy that challenge. I mean, at that level, you're reffing um, the, the best athletes. Reffing around 60 matches a year. You'll find a common phrase in the referee community. It's uh, for the love of the game. Uh, soccer to a lot of us is a big part of our lives, whether played it, watch it or referee it or all three and it's given back to the game something that helps ease the stress of his day job it just allows me to challenge or to accept and really take on any challenge and a stressful environment at work it, it kind of is easy after running six to eight miles in a match and getting yelled at from everybody crediting Sedgwick County for allowing him to pursue both of his passions it's a neat honor I've gotten to travel to do some really high-level games, uh, work with referees across the United States. Uh, it's just been a very rewarding second career, if you will.
ever needed a snack while visiting the Sedgwick County Courthouse, you've probably seen Wes Brummer. He and his wife Debbie run the Snack Zone. Brummer also furnishes all the vending machines in the county. But when he's not keeping us fed, he spends his time writing historical fiction. I grew up in a family that liked to tell stories. Uh, my folks grew up during the Depression. That's part of what inspired his book, Dust and Roses. It's basically about a young woman who takes a big fall and the rest of the story is, is her redeeming herself. Writing hasn't come without challenges. Brummer was born with severe low vision. Describing color, um, that was probably one of my weaknesses in the story. I, I didn't put enough uh, color description. But that's never stopped him. He sold about 150 copies of Dust and Roses, which can be found in the snack zone or on Amazon, and he's working on his second book. My character is a German prisoner of war that finds himself in Camp Concordia. He hopes to have it complete by summer of 2018. <laughs> Habitat for Humanity provides opportunities for families to achieve affordable home ownership. Without the volunteers, we don't have the hands to reach out to recruit the families. We don't have the hands to go and meet with these families and help them along their journey. One of those volunteers is Sedgwick County employee Greg Gann. Next thing you know, I'm on three committees and here it is 10 plus years later and uh, it's just a great fit for me. Gann serves on the Home Buyers Committee, reviewing applicants and doing on-site home visits. He is always enthusiastic um, and excited to introduce families, to tell their story, and to talk about uh, not only the challenges that they face, but how they overcome, uh, overcame those challenges. You realize just how difficult it is for families to find uh, clean, safe, affordable housing in good neighborhoods uh, where they can raise their family uh, with, without much care. These houses are filled with love. It doesn't matter if you don't know which end of a hammer to use we'll find something that fits your ability and you can participate. Having volunteers like Greg who are committed, who are willing to give of their time, their talent, their treasure, um, it, we can't ask for anything more. It's, that's, it's truly a blessing. <sighs> wow, every day is a great day. Um, I come to the job sites, we go on home visits, uh, we meet. Um, I can't think of a bad day, not once. Um, it, it, it's truly been uh, life-changing for me. If you're hurt, you want help to come fast. That's where these bikes come in. We're able to fit into places the ambulance can't. The Sedgwick County EMS bike team was started in 2009 with the help of grants and community donations. Crew members must try out to be part of the team. I love coming down here to Riverfest and helping out. I love biking, so I'm just kind of combining two of my loves together. Then they work in two-person crews. Additional support is provided with this, 
It's how patients are transported out of the crowd after the bike team provides treatment. It's also proven to be faster and more cost effective. Our response times are uh, one tenth of what they used to be down here and we're using uh, 75% less uh, personnel to get the job done. And provides a great opportunity for the public. Just being able to interact with the community I think is pretty awesome. They could have come up and ask us a lot more questions. We're a little bit more accessible than we are in the ambulances usually. So we get to see a lot more of the people and hang out with the kids.
Lake Afton, more than 720 acres of fun, all within a 20 minute drive from Wichita. Join us as we take a look inside the park. I think the, the biggest draw for this lake is its proximity to Wichita in the big city. It's close, it's convenient. There's something for everyone, boating, swimming, water skiing, fishing, camping, looking at the stars, and much more. Tom Ames has been coming out to the lake for 10 years. This flying field on the west side of the lake is open to the public for sport and hobby flying. Now, this is one of the very best places to fly in the whole state, actually. Uh, lots of open space, real nice runway, uh, it's just a great facility for us. We really appreciate being able to come out here. Maybe you're looking for the catch of the day. Bread and butter fish for Lake Afton is, of course, the catfish. The largest catfish that I'm aware of that's been caught out of here weighed 86 pounds back in the late 80s. Or just a little peace and quiet. Clear night. You can see and hear everything. You see all the, the lanterns, you can hear people talking. It's, it's just an amazing sight to see. And the excitement continues. It's been a popular spot for people to attend and visit as it continues today. Celebrating 75 years of fun in the sun. I think this lake is, is cemented in, in its, its time frame. It's going to be here for many, many more years to come. As we were going through the records, we discovered some very interesting things. The role of the Register of Deeds office is to file and store all real estate documents. Basically, it's it's ownership of land, and it's very important, and it went, you know started in the 1800s. But that wasn't always the case. Like this depiction of God, were these instructions to make a wig. I think some people just wanted to file them here because it was an opportunity to have it filed officially somewhere, and maybe this for them was the most convenient place. But it's the history that's the most interesting. These are the first plats of land for Wichita. So this is what the city looked like when it was brand new in 1870. And the history that made Wichita 
Utah the air capital of the world. Deeds to the Travel Air Company, started by Beach, Stearman, and Cessna. So these, these aircraft companies go back a long way. These all started in the 1920s. There's even a local connection to former President Obama. His grandparents and other family members lived in Wichita in the 60s. His grandparents moved from Wichita in the 1960s to go to Hawaii where they helped his mother raise him. And then there's the Wild West. This deed is from Billy the Kid's mother who ran a company washing soldiers clothes. She also dabbled in real estate. So there's several deeds where uh, she's granting property and also where she she bought her own property. Billy the Kid also lived with his mother here in Wichita. These documents are so important and they're so unique that we want to preserve them. This is just the tip of the iceberg. We have more. We have lots more. Looking for news and information in Sedgwick County? There's an app for that. Download the Sedgwick County app. Inside, you'll have access to our Facebook and Twitter streams. Get notifications from the county. Search for jobs. Look at our website. Watch videos. Leave your ideas or opinions. Get weather and emergency updates. Report storm damage. Build an emergency kit. Download the Sedgwick County app for Android or Apple. You'll find it in the App Store or the Play Store. Did you ever wonder how first responders in Sedgwick County find homes in the unincorporated areas of the county? Hi, I'm Bill Hinkle with Sedgwick County Fire District 1. Did you know that Sedgwick County Fire District 1 has a program called RAMP? RAMP stands for Rural Address Marking Program. This is a program that is offered free of charge to all citizens living in the unincorporated areas of Sedgwick County. Through this program, you can visit our website, www.sedgwickcounty.org. From there, go to the Fire District page and find the ramp form and enter your information. Choose from vertical, horizontal, or diagonal sign that we will produce for you free of charge. This will be a green sign with a white reflective numbers which helps first responders locate your property from a distance in the event of an emergency. Once the sign is produced, one of our fire crews will come to your location and install the reflective sign for you. This ramp program helps first responders quickly locate your property in the event of an emergency, cutting down on possible delays in response times due to your address not being visible from the road. All responders in Sedgwick County benefit from this program. These signs can be seen both day and night and during inclement weather. Help us help you in case of an emergency. Post your address for responders to find. Again, this is a free program offered by Sedgwick County Fire District 1. For more information, visit our website at www.sedgwickcounty.org or call us at 660-3473.
are back from executive session and um, I will call the regular meeting of the Board of County Commissioners back to order and declare that while we were in executive session no binding action was taken. However, I think we do have some uh, business to take care of, Mr. Counselor. Mr. Chairman, we have an item. Ms. Powell is going to present it to you regarding um, a waiver of a conflict of interest with Wichita State University. Good morning, Commissioners. Karen Powell, Deputy County Counselor. This item is a um, in regard to a former attorney with our office, Misha J Jacob Warren. She's now employed with WSU, Wichita State University. And in her in the course of her duties at WSU, she may be asked to work on an item that uh, she worked at while here at the county in regard to the WATC agreement with um, uh, and, and all those related matters. Out of a, an abundance of caution, uh, we would, um, we, there's not necessarily going to be a conflict, but out, out of an abundance of caution, we'd recommend that uh, the commission waive that and allow her to uh, actually represent WSU in the course of those issues. Uh, we don't see that there would be any detriment to the county commission in signing this and allowing her to do that. And in fact, there may be a benefit because she has some knowledge of uh, the county's position on those items. So we'd, we'd recommend that uh, that the board authorize the chairman to sign a, a, uh, a document called potential conflict disclosure. And um, I do have the original for you. So. Thank All you. right, thank you. So we just uh, need to approve this waiver of um, conflict of interest. And yes, the yes. A approve the a approve the waiver of the conflict, and authorize the chair to sign is what I'd recommend the motion be. Mr. Chair, I, I uh, move that we approve the waiver of conflict and authorize you to sign. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion, commissioners? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, call the vote. Commissioner Dennis? Aye. Commissioner Ransaw? Aye. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Chairman Enru? Aye. Thank you, Karen. Is Thank that you. all, Mr. Counselor? Is that all, Mr. Manager? <clears throat> that being the case, uh, we will be adjourned. Thank you.